Okay. Okay. Thank you once again for joining us. So I'm really glad you're taking your time over the weekend to join us and we are really appreciative of your presence here. We are local community here in Abuja and we really appreciate your presence, honoring us with your audience. So thank you so much for coming in. So the next on the agenda will be introduction of the organizers, introduction of the speaker, then we allow our speaker to take in the floor, then we have Q&A, then we have both of terms. So I'm the organizer here, um, I'm Bilikisu Mumi Adirito. So I'm a business data analyst based here in Abuja, and I'm currently working as an art developer for the Shiny platform for African Field Epidemiology Network here in Abuja. So I'm a passionate user of R and um, I've learned a lot from, especially from our speaker here. I love, I love, I love, I love to watch her. And I've really learned a lot. I've seen that passion and I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. So then the next thing will be my partner here, Marvelous Solatunji. She's a research analyst based here in Abuja. So um, actually, I would have loved her to be here, but she's a passionate user of her as well. And we have both worked together for a long time. And I, I, I hope she'll be joining us before the end of the program. So that's that. So the next will be now introducing our speaker. Yeah, I'm so, 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 so delighted to have her here. So I'm super excited to welcome you to today's webinar again. So I'm excited to introduce our speaker. So she is an R user, a passionate one. So she is a data scientist and a software engineer with R Studio. What's special about her is that she has written books with her collaborators on text mining with R, Supervised machine learning for text analysis in R and modeling with tidy data principles in R. So she also has a name on the tidy text package. So, so I think everybody knows where I'm going now. So she is the one that best suits the webinar for today. So without wasting much of our time, I would like to also tell you a little bit more about her. She studied physics and astronomy and completed a PhD in 2005. She has since worked in academia, teaching and doing research and ed tech before moving into the science and discovering art. She was a former data scientist at Stack Overflow, where she actually did a lot of research on trying to understand software engineers and developers as well. So she is both an international speaker and a real world practitioner focusing on data analysis and machine learning practice. She resides in Scott Lake City, UT, with her husband, three kids, and two cats. And something very special I have seen in her watching her and listening to her presentations is that she is humble, bold, and beautiful. So I'm really, really honored to welcome, and you should join me in welcoming Julia Silke. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank so much you so much. That was such a beautiful introduction. I appreciate that so very much. And I am so happy to be here. <clears throat> I um I think I didn't quite understand the timing of the um of, of that was planned. So I I do I think I thought it was a one hour meeting, not a two hour meeting. So, but I am really excited to be here um, for the um for the one hour meeting. So that will be great. Um, so we'll 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 get through and uh, talk about this. So I will get started on sharing my screen once I am able to do that. Awesome. And let's do this. And then I will start my slides here. All right. All right, so what I want to do as I walk through the time that we have together is to talk about um, text mining from a big picture high um, level and to talk about starting from exploratory data analysis. Say, say you have text data 
and you, you, where do you start from? And then as you work through greater complexity, where can you end up? Where can you end up with using text data for machine learning? So um, <clears throat> thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. Um, I, uh, so you already know quite a lot now about who I am. Um, you can find me on GitHub and on um, Twitter and various places at Julia Silgi, that's my handle. And my website is there at juliasilgi.com. And like, like many of you all probably, um, I've worked in, in organizations where we had text data and that text data was um, survey responses or that text data was um, um, uh, generated by our business processes or, um, uh, you know, like something about our, uh, where our, um, uh, let me do this so I can see the, chat. Okay. Yeah. So something about the, um, our business, um, generated text data. And this is very common at this point. The um, text data is being generated all the time by people um, and businesses so that we, we have it, we have access to it. But at the same time, the ability to know what to do with it is somewhat more rare. Natural language processing or NLP training is somewhat scarce in the real world. Like if you actually get down on the ground with the people doing the work, um, it is more rare to find people who are trained in you know, computational linguistics or something like that. So it is more rare to find people who have formal training. And that is true of me as well. Like many of you, I was trained on, you know, nice rectangles of numbers of you know, numeric data or factor data, you know, like what do we do with that? We know what to do with that. Um, but when it comes to unstructured data, like text data, it is, um, we have less training and less background to know what to do. So what I would like to do during the talk that we have here today is make the argument that using tidy data principles and methods that are largely count-based methods um, uh, based on counting, based on counting what, what we have here, um, uh, results in a, um, a happy, happy uh, good results and happy workflows, happy res um, uh, results where we get good results for not too much effort. And what I mean here um, is that uh, our, our, we can be, we can have um, uh, workflows that are easier and more effective. Um, easier in that they um, connect to um, tools that you probably are already using, um, tools that are well uh, established in um, the data analyst toolkit in the R world and more effective because we, are, we can connect the um, world that um, uh, of text mining and text analysis to the rest of how we build models, how we build, um, how we do analysis, how we do EDA, how we build graphs, so that it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm doing something separate. No, we're doing, we're connecting and we're doing something that is the same or similar. So this work is based on a, um, uh, an R package called Tidy Text, which I'm the maintainer of. And the, the um, goals, um, the idea behind Tidy Text is to you is to provide functions and supporting data sets so that you can use, um, approach your text data um, with the same kind of fluent, um, tidy, a uh, data principle approach that you pro that you may approach other parts of your data. So if you want to think about it, it is it is like a link between uh, tidy versus tooling and the text data that you have. So you come to some um, uh, data set that is that is raw text. What is it that you want to do? How do you connect it? If you're someone who likes to use um, dplyr for data uh, manipulation ggplot2 for um, data visualization, then um, what tidy text acts as is a bridge, a bridge to say, oh yes, you can use all of those tools um, with, with um, your text data. So we're gonna walk through um, 
Oh, okay. So, so uh, a good place to go to if you want to learn more about this, um, and you say after this talk to dig deeper for the pieces of this talk that are about getting started, um, is this book text mining with R. So this book is available in its entirety at um, tidytextmining.com, or you can also get a paper copy if that's something that works better for you. And so what this, the goal of this book, the idea of this book is to provide um, um, uh, in the first half of the book provides um, the uh, underlying ideas and um, concepts that you need to be able to use tidy data principles for text. And then the last half of the book are um, uh, uh, deep, full examples beginning to end analyses for let's have a, you know, a pretty realistic data set that um, um, that, that starts with, with pretty raw text that has not been processed. How do you start from there and learn um, and gain insight from that text? Um, and it covers things about um, uh, uh, exploratory data analysis for text, um, uh, visualizing, summarizing through to some uh, unsupervised um, approaches. So here in this talk, what I want to do is I want to start exactly there. I want to start with exploratory data analysis for text. What does it look like? What are we trying to um, measure? What are some of the approaches that we take? Then I want to move further and say, if we, if I want to um, uh, measure something more, can, more um, uh, detailed, or I want to use more sophisticated measurements about um, uh, what is in my text, what are some more detailed kind of analyses that I can do? So we'll talk about um, n-grams and more a complex analysis. And then finally, we'll talk about uh, machine learning for text and um, how we move from uh, what, take what we learn during EDA and apply it when we do modeling and machine learning for text. So let's start with that first stage. So just like you would do exploratory data analysis for any data set where you know it, you, you are presented with some new data set and you ask questions like um, uh, what like if I were to summarize this data set, what do I learn? If I were to visualize this data set, what can I learn? And um, when I take this iterative, exploratory process of EDA um, do, do I, when I, and I get insight from it, um, can I use that to make a decision or can I use that to inform my next steps when it comes to you know, making a model or um, whatever kind of data product I might need uh, to do with this data next. So let's walk through a few examples with um, some, some, some example data with Jane Austen, who happens to be my personal favorite writer. So we'll, we'll go look through a few examples with there. So EDA for text might look something like this, where we, um, we look at the, um, we summarize and we visualize. And when we use tidy data principles with text, you, we are able to fluently move from raw text through to, um, uh, to our familiar uh, dplyr verbs and ggplot2 visualization. So this is a visualization made with ggplot2 and we're able to ask a question like, what are the most common words in um, Jane Austen's novels? So this, these are, this is a group of all of Jane Austen's novels. And so we, we, you know, we look, we see words like, um, you know, Mr. Mrs. Miss, good time, great, dear lady, sir. You know, these are the kinds of words that Jane Austen uses in her, in her um, novels. So this is, this is, and we can get to this very quickly and iteratively um, uh, when we use tidy data principles. We can also do um, more complex things when we deal with um, just EDA, just, just counting and um, 
uh, exploratory data analysis, and often it's still very impactful. Uh, before my current job, I worked at Stack Overflow. I was a data scientist there, and we did a big survey every year. When we said um, uh, one of the things that we asked in the, on the survey one year was, um, now let me move this a little bit so I can see. So uh, we asked, what are the what are the best What's the best thing about using Stack Overflow? What's the worst thing about using Stack Overflow? Um, what is the most annoying thing about using about Stack Overflow? And so what this what this shows us is these are some of the best things, right? Where we say um, uh, users told us, you know, like they they solve their problems, they gain, they learn, they get knowledge, they find, they quickly find um helpful things you know like these are the best things um and so we we were quickly and this is just counting this is just counting right and so we're quickly able to say ah this is what people come to stack overflow on the flip side you know if we we can go and um see them also the most the most difficult or annoying things and we're able to see that oh yeah people have struggles with um uh Un, unkindness with um, un, or unprofessional conduct on Stack Overflow with um, toxic community. And um, so we're able to learn both the positive and negative. And this is actionable. This is um, uh, gives us insight and in, uh, in, in a data driven way. So this and, and again, the, no, there's no you know, fancy modeling. There's no nothing. Nothing fancy is going on here. We're able, we're able to show um, our uh, community, we're able to show decision makers what results are just with exploratory data analysis. Um, uh, another thing that we can do in this exploratory phase is be able to uh, use supporting data sets. So this, um, what this plot shows, whoops, sorry, what this plot shows is um, how does the um, sentiment of different um, of these six novels, how does it change through the course of the novel? So what the way that this works is that you join um, a sentiment lexicon. Um, so a list of words that are scored. How do you, you join with an inner join that together with um, the words that are in the data set and then uh, count them up, you know, for, at interest um, uh, in um, bins during the book and then you were able to see like what are the arcs over the books so for example in pride of prejudice you know like that middle section where it, it dips down so much that's where like um the main character um has a terrible a terrible marriage proposal that goes very badly um and and um and then it goes you know it's good again for a while and then like her sister elopes with a terrible person and then, you know, at the end, there, there are these happy endings in most of these. So these correspond to what our human um, understanding of these readings, our human readings of these books and what happens in them. So this is another example. A great thing about using tidy data principles for an approach like this is that we're, be a we're able to say what words contribute to each sentiment. And often these kinds of sentiment lexicons are not great fits for some uh, uh, corpus for some reason or other. So for example, um, in, um, in uh, Jane Austen's novels, um, the we've got, look at all those good, those positive words, good, great, like, better, enough, happy. But, you know, those look like good words, but look at that top word that's negative, miss. Miss is scored as a negative word. Um, and in Jane Austen's novels, um, miss is not a negative word. It's a, um, it is a title for a woman, for a young unmarried woman. And so when we use tidy data principles, we're able to um, question, we're able to interrogate and understand our results very clearly. So uh, tidy data principles for EDA lets us summarize lets us visualize, lets us interrogate our results in a fluent, um, iterative way. Um, an, another uh, uh, sort of step up in complexity, once we, if we start sort of at counting and then we wanna move up, we can start to use some um, quantities, compute some quantities to help us understand what it is that um, 
is going on and get some information about our document. One of the um, first ways what we often can do that, like as we step up in complexity, is by computing um, term frequency inverse document frequency. So it's called TF, TF, IDF. So the term frequency is just, um, just counting again, like how many times as a word used in a document. And inverse document frequency is a, it's the it's the natural log of a ratio. So the um, the ratio of how many documents do you have in a, like a pile in a group of documents over how many documents use some term. So if you have um, if you have some uh, word that is used in all your documents, like in English, the word the or of, then that ratio is one and the natural log of one is zero. And so that gets weighted down. If you have some document or some word that is only used in one document, then that ratio is big and that, um, so then the natural log is bigger. So it, it doesn't get weighted down. So when you multiply these two things together, you get what's called TF IDF. And that um, ends up being a statistic that, you, so it's a statistic that, of, um, uh, of, that you measure about words in documents, in a collection of documents, and it helps you um, find things that are um, characteristic of documents. So for example, um, this is term frequency for words in a Jane Austen's books again. So um, there are uh, some, there's a few words that are used a ton. So these are the words like the, of, and in English. And then there's, um, uh, many words that are just used a few times. These are the rare words. So this is very common in language. Um, it's called, it's like a power law or close to a power law usually. It's so common it has a special name. It's called Zipf's law, Z-I-P-F, Zipf's law. So if we, um, so this is term frequency. If we then compute um, inverse document frequency, which is a really good fit for, um, uh, tidy data principles because it um, uh, you do it you can do it like uh, uh, term by term you get results like this so these are the highest TF IDF words in Jane Austen's novels so if you look at say um, Pride and Prejudice here we see Darcy Bennett Bingley Elizabeth if you look at um, Persuasion we see Elliot Wentworth Walter Russell if you've read Jane Austen um, you recognize these people and places but even if you've never read Jane Austen at all you don't care at all, um, you probably can look at this and see that these are proper nouns. These are the names of people and places. And this is, um, this is exactly what TFIDF does. Um, it finds what is most distinctive about one document compared to other documents. So in Jane, in Jane Austen's books, she used con similar language from one book to the other. And so the thing that is most distinctive about one book compared to the other books are the people and the places. That's what makes it most distinctive. This is how TFIDF works. Um, uh, here, we computed TFIDF for really long documents and only six of them, but TFIDF is flexible and can be applied to lots of different kinds of documents. So, for example, I worked with this data set at NASA that was like a data set of data sets, and I worked with the metadata, like um, the title of the data sets, the descriptions of the data sets. And I computed TFIDF of um, those. So, um, and again, this is something that is, um, you know, pretty quick and easy and fast to be able to compute. And if we look, this is very different though. Instead of, instead of six really long documents, this is thousands of really short documents. And, but we see similar, we see that it works here as well. So the, um, here, here are what, like, what are the, the um, these, doc, these um, data sets also had keywords. And so I've connected the, um, uh, the high TFID words to the keywords. Um, so the highest TFIDF words of data sets um, that were to do with seismology um, are things like risk and earthquake 
and acceleration and category. And on the solar activity one, we see things like um, solstice and shutter and diode. So um, TFID wor TFIDF it works and is flexible in many different kinds of contexts. So if we start with just EDA, counting, summarizing, we can then move a step higher in um, complexity to something like T TFIDF, which is again, um, you know, pretty straightforward, right? We're just counting and then taking a ratio and a natural log, but we're able to like learn even more. Let's take it up another level um, of again, not nothing too difficult. Like we're not we're not yet to something something we can't really understand the math for quite in a quite straightforward way. But let's move the level up a little bit and let's talk about um, n-grams, networks, and negation. So, so far, everything that we have talked about, the, um, the, we've been interested in the, um, the uh, uh, analysis at the level of the single word. But here, what we're looking at is we can extend that to looking at um, the observational unit being n grams or um, uh, in the the uh, the um, uh, units of more than one word. So a bigram is a unit of a two words. I just saw I just saw in text a question. Maybe I'll just say this one more time and then move on. So a TFIDF is not a um, it's not a statistic that is. Um, rooted in theory, it is an empirical, is like, so basically something that's made up, it's like an empirical statistic that is shown to work well. So what, a, what TFIDF does is it tells us uh, a high TFIDF word is a word that um, is a, is characteristic of a document in a collection of documents. Okay, so um, uh, let's move on from single words and talk about groups of multiple words, such as a bigram, which is a um, pair of words. And so when we when we uh, tokenize to bigrams, we like slide along and find all the overlapping pairs of bigrams. And when we look at bigrams, we can also do trigrams, right? Like sliding windows of three words and, and so forth. And what looking at groups of multiple words allows us to do is it allows us to, um, uh, it allows us to understand more about um, context of words and um, how words are used together. So what this plot shows us is a is a network of, wor of words of bigrams of words that were used together on um, uh, you know a couple of years ago on the Stack Overflow developer survey. So this is that same question that I showed you the very simple uh, visualization for that was just for counting. And so now what we're looking at, so it was um, oh no, I think this is a different question. This was um, what uh, uh, um, a question about what do you, uh, uh, this is a question like, what do you, um, oh my gosh, I lost it. And I got so much stuff on my screen right now. Uh, <laughs> okay, so this is a question where we ask users on the Stack Overflow developer survey, what do they, um, what are, what is a thing, ah, I remember now, what is a thing that they would change on Stack Overflow if they could? Okay, and so um, it was an open free text question, and so people could say whatever they want on it, and, and that can feel overwhelming to, as to an analyst, right, where you're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with all this data? This question, I think, had 10, like 10,000 responses, and you're like, oh, what am I going to do with all of that data? I think a really good answer when you are in that situation is to do a network analysis of, of bigrams, because what that tells you is how are words connected together? What kind of words are people using together? So we asked, what would you change if you could change Stack Overflow? And we're able to see here, you know, people are saying things like, um, uh, there's a cluster here around like questions and answers. So um, some 
someone, you know, marked my, you know, I, we, I want to change how things are happening around duplicate closing of questions or people are asking similar questions and, you know, they want to change something about that. Um, the best answer is often not correct, you know, like, like the accepted answer is often not the correct answer is like what people are telling us about um, that the, the answer is often outdated, you know, like people are saying, telling us things about that, um, you know, outdated old language version, right, like, and we've probably all had that experience on Stack Overflow where you come, and you're like, this, this answer is so old. And the, like there's a newer answer underneath that doesn't have as many upvotes because it's newer, right? But like that's the one that works now. We have, uh, you know, a cluster up here around like reputation and a system and like upvoting and downvoting where people say they want to change stuff about that. Um, uh, someone who, people who say it works well, uh, like a, a cluster around like a toxic community. Um, so these are, so what we, what we're able to see from this kind of result is take an enormous amount of text data and visualize it in a way that, um, you know, decision makers, people like you and me are able to see it and really understand what are people talking about when they say um, what they want to change. So you're able to get to something like this from an enormous amount of text data by um, looking at Bigrams and making a net, being able to find like a network analysis of it. Um, here's, a, I, I'll just very quickly go through this because this is a, getting a little bit outdated now, but this is a similar kind of thing. We asked people about their, um, what they thought the most realistic fictional character was um, uh, that, that was a coder, a person who wrote code and it was free text so people could write whatever they wanted. And so what I did was I made a network analysis and then coded those answers and then use that coding to build a little dictionary and then use that dictionary to then um, be able to make a bar chart. So sometimes this kind of visualization can be the product, the end, and sometimes it can be an intermediate path to get to like to be able to make uh, some do some automated coding. Um, biograms also can help us look for differences. So if we go back to Jane Austen, um, what we have here is all the biograms that begin with he and she. And then if you find all the bigrams that begin with he and she, you then look at what is the next um, word. And then what are the differences? So this looks at the log odds uh, and what, what has a higher likelihood of coming after she and what look, has a higher likelihood of coming after he. And we see that women remember, read, and feel, while men like stop, take, reply, come, married. So what this really emphasizes is that Jane Austen's books are about the inner lives of women. Um, and and uh, the men in these books are portrayed very as um, externally. We only see them doing things. We never like know what they're thinking. And so um, we can look at these kinds of results and understand uh, what texts are like, and even get like pretty interesting insight into um, it, uh, issues around, um, you know, gender representation. Um, I extended that analysis to a, a data set of film scripts where we looked at the um, screen direction and film scripts and looked at a difference between what are men and women actors directed to do in film scripts and we see like women and we see things like she gasps she flinches she shudders and then there are things in the middle there which men and women are are equally likely to be instructed to do like like she said he said like pretty even um uh, she grows, he grows, she lifts, he lifts. And then over at the other end, we see things like he, he shoots, um, he um, honks, rams. So we see these really significant, like we can understand how in film are men and women portrayed differently through, through these differences. So this is, so um, bigrams are, for example, like bigrams are a way to be able to understand differences between groups um, in, a, in a statistical way. All right, so we started at EDA. Let's count 
Let's summarize, let's visualize. We moved up to TFIDF. Let's use a, um, let's measure some statistics about words. Let's open up from single words to multiple words so we can understand more about context. Let's move up even a little bit further. Let's move into modeling and machine learning. And let's talk about one example of here while we're together. Let's talk about one example of unsupervised modeling and one example of supervised modeling, an example of supervised modeling. Because you can do just like any kind of data, text data is just data, it's just data. So just like with any data, you can um, do unsupervised modeling or supervised modeling. You can do the same with text data. A kind of unsupervised modeling that works well with text data is called topic modeling. And the idea here is that you model the text as, it, as if each document is a mixture of topics and each topic is a mixture of words. So you have this idea of a topic and you're like, okay, I think my documents are about things, some topics, and I want to model and find out what they are. Um, so here's, here's like a result to give you an idea of what happens here. So let's say we take these four books um, that are here, these four sort of classic English books, and we rip them apart into chapters. So, and then we throw them in a pile and we mix them up. So we've got like a chapter of Pride and Prejudice and a chapter of War of the Worlds and we just mix them up. And then we, tr we train a topic model to say, hey, can you tell the difference between these? Can you, can you pick up a chapter of this pile and can you tell a difference between a chapter from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and a chapter of Pride and Prejudice? Can you tell the difference between them? And what this um, plot is doing on the y-axis here, it has the probability of being generated from one of those topics. And what this plot shows is, is yeah, it does a pretty good job. It, the model can do a pretty good job of learning the differences. This is unlabeled, no labels, unsupervised um, uh, modeling here. So what, if you have unlabeled text data, Topic modeling can be a great way to learn what is it about? What is it about? Um, here is uh, some results of topic modeling from a large corpus of posts on Hacker News. And um, this is a different way of kind of looking at it. Uh, like, um, so this was, what is the probability of a document being generated from a topic this is now what are the highest probability words of being generated from a topic. So that first topic is the, the biggest topic, like the biggest topic across all of the Hacker News comments. So it's like, like really good, you know, it's, it's kind of filler words, if you will. The next one is like, people don't think no even just, so, so but it's different, it's different words. And if we go down, we, we're starting to see words that are starting to be about things. So if we go down to in like to the blue ones, we're starting to see ones that are kind of about, about time and articles like years, article two first days ago, like things that are about, they're discussing time, things that happened in the past. And then we start to get to very more specific things like money, market value, buy, price, low, and you know, software experience, project, build, work, like team. So, um, and as we keep going down here, you know, like uh, design, computer, human, future, research, science. So if you look at text that is being generated here somewhere, some proportion of it is like, um, here is, is being generated by, is like a uh, common kind of words of people just talking. And then some proportion of it starts to be about very specific stuff like, um, you know, on Hacker News, people are talking about money and markets. People are talking about uh, design and computers and whatnot. So this is what unsupervised modeling um, gets you. Um, I've got, I've got, if you're interested in learning more on this, my favorite way to do topic modeling in R is the STM package, and there's good support for using it with tidy data principles. So I've got some content on YouTube for that if you'd like to see more. Um, and I'm just going to quickly, you know, kind of go through that and talk about the last example here that we have, which is um, 
uh, supervised modeling or predictive modeling. So we started all the way back at just EDA and counting, and then we're going to keep moving forward through here to um, the last thing that I want to talk about in this, like, what can you do with text? What can you do with text mining and talk about predictive modeling or supervised modeling? And here, the idea here is that you have labels. You have labels on your text data and you want to predict that label with new data. Maybe that label is a like a, a category or maybe it's a numeric value, but you have you have some kind of um, label and you want to be able to predict it for new data that comes in. So I have a new book that is in his very close to being done phases. Um, it is available here at smalltar.com in its entirety. And it is not yet out in paper, but it is getting there. It is very, very close. We're copy editing it currently. And the idea here is so it uses the tidy models framework, which is what I use on uh, which what I build in my day job now. And we will use text data as the features as input to predict some kind of outcome. That outcome could be a numeric value or that outcome could be some kind of category label like yes or no. So here um, we want to use the same kind of approaches that we use in um, in all kinds of predictive modeling, where we want to split our data into training and testing. We want to make resampling folds so that we can do a good job of estimating how our modeling is doing. Um, we, there are some differences in, in that. Um, uh, we will build, use the text data to build features for machine learning in a different way. Um, we, we can understand, we, here's some example of what those features might look like. So this is an example model for um, data set, a data set of opinions from the United States Supreme Court. So like they go and they write you know, an opinion when they make a decision. And um, the, what we're predicting is a numeric value. It's the year. It's it, it's a uh, because the United States Supreme Court has been writing for a couple hundred years now, and so we can and we can predict the year based on the text. And so what things make what what tokens what words make something be more likely to um, be a recent opinion, and what words make it more likely to be an old opinion, an opinion from a long time ago. And so we see these two these differences here, these differences across this. And this is the kind of thing that we can um, get out of, uh, out of a predictive model from, from text, from a predictive model from text. And of course, just like with any predictive model, we can um, compute metrics to understand how well is the model doing. Here is code to make an ROC curve, which will look like this. This is um, uh, for uh, 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 a classification model. So one where we're predicting a label, like a yes or no label. Um, so, and we've got, you know, actually 10 resampling folds on this, um, on this plot. Uh, so we can understand like how, how much variation are there in our plots here. Okay, so we covered so much ground here. And I just want to kind of highlight a few things, the other things that I'm interested in working on that we can like continue to talk about in the future, although not right now. And that is how do we create the features for machine learning from text? How do we take, you know, raw text and uh, make it so that we can make some kind of feature that a model can use to learn from. Um, the book, that, that last book that I mentioned, um, goes into that and like the first basically third of that book is all about this. So this is something I'm really interested in. Um, the next thing that I wanna talk about, uh, or I wanna just mention, is about fairness and analysis of text. Because um, uh, much like, um, <clears throat> uh, all, I mean, all data, like all data, uh, and machine learning uh, reflects the reality that um, we have training data and we can, um, we, we reiterate um, uh, the reality that that training data reflected in our models. But when we use language data in models, um, it is, it is 
it is literally true that whatever um, biases, whatever, whatever reality is encoded um, in that in that language data, we are um, we are recreating it and and reiterating it in our model. So that means that we want to know about what's going on with our language data and be aware of it when we um, use it in some kind of model. And then lastly, I want to just mention um, uh, the idea of creating um, uh, understanding how the machine learning models that we affect um, are connected to um, the people who will be impacted by them. And that these, when we get to, you know, real world situations, um, uh, our models are not abstract things, but rather things that impact people who are real. And um, so understanding, bringing in the people who will be impacted by those earlier helps us to um, uh, build better and more accurate and more um, appropriate and more um, fair uh, models in the long run. And with that, I will say uh, thank you very much. I think I'll be able to stay around for like um, five to 10 minutes for questions if we can do that. So I'll leave this here and then I've got um, the chat window up and um, we can take a, a, I can stay like for the next five or 10 minutes for questions. Okay. Okay, thank you so much for your time when we'll, we really appreciate your time schedule. Um, so without wasting much of our time, if you have questions or maybe comments, we would like to take that right now. Okay. So while we're waiting for questions, I think the best place for you to really learn from these honorable ladies, just to go to our website, there's a juliasurvey.com. So there's a lot for you to learn there. And our YouTube channel is filled with knowledge. That's just what I will always refer to it. Because anytime we want to learn about tidy models, we want to visualization, just need to, there's none of our videos that you wouldn't get something to learn about, especially visualizations. So, and that really speaks about us. And um, so I would employ all of us to check out the books as well as our, our website and the YouTube channel. You always get a link to our YouTube channel from the website, so that's just it. So I think we don't have much of questions here so I think um, the last thing that I would love to say is that there are some videos on text mining on our YouTube channel, which you can learn from. So I would advise that we'll go on because the topic today is we want to learn about this test that we can take to get to understand text mining. And I think she has done a really good job in dealing with that for now. So. At this point, I would really like to thank you, Juliet. I'm really appreciative of your presence here. We're really honored to have you. So like we said at the beginning, we're a local community here in Abuja. So we're doing our best to really um, showcase the beauty of art. And uh, we've really done a lot. So we we'll still hope we can do more. So we're employing everybody to keep out to our meetup channel and our LinkedIn channel. So to follow us up on all that we've done, we're doing and we're still going to be doing in the future. So thank you very much, Julia. And thank you everybody for honoring us with your presence here. Thank you so much. And we look forward to having you in the next webinar. Thank you. God bless. Okay, so also, sorry, we'll have the video on our YouTube channel before the end of the week. During the week, we should have it there. Thank you. Fantastic. So much. Yeah. Someone asked a question about making a word cloud, and there is. And if you look on tidytextmining.com, I think in chapter two, um, let me stop sharing. Let me. Stop sharing. Oh my gosh. Okay. okay.
Uh, and I will find the link, but yes, you sure can. Yes, it's in chapter two. I will drop this here for you. Okay. Okay. I think that answers your question, Stephen. Thank you so much. All right. It was really great to meet you all. I'm going to hop off. Um, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So bye, -bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>